Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this episode of the Power Hour. Today we're here with Peter McCardle in studio again. We're going to be talking about heater cores. Now, many of you might be familiar with our temperature control division of standard motor products, namely Four Seasons. And, you know, if you're familiar with, with Four Seasons, a lot of people associate them with these uh, new premium compressors or the compressor installation kits. But one of the key product categories for Four Seasons is also heater cores. Sell a ton of them. This is a great time of year to be talking about heater cores. As many of you probably have some customers coming to the shop now wondering, you know, how come I'm not getting good heat? Or they're starting to smell some uh, some coolant in the vehicle there. So Peter today has got a great presentation, a lot of information to share with you, some installation tips, some good best practices to make the job last longer. So that being said, I'm going to exit and turn it over here to Peter. Thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> okay, you're all very welcome, folks. Uh, my name is Peter McCardle, and we've got uh, quite a bit to cover in a short space of time. So without further ado, we are going to get on the way. Um, <clears throat> So here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we want to talk about you know basic heater system operation, very, very brief uh, contemplation there. And we want to talk about heater core designs and types. It does, you know, while this is for the most part a nomenclature exercise, it does can affect the way heater cores fail and so on. So it's good to be aware of it. And then we're going to wrap this session up with some diagnostic tips and ideas for, you know, as you go working on some of these vehicles, what would be, you know, some of the things to watch out for. So um, the first thing I would emphasize to here, there's a kind of, a, we're looking here at a climate control system overview. Uh, remember, you know, these days, the, we call it the HVAC system, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, meaning that it's a, you know, it's the system that's got to keep us, you know, nice and cool on a hot summer day. And the same combination and variation of components has to keep us um, nice and warm in the wintertime. And a problem in one system can often spill over or uh, affect the other in some way. For or just a brief example of that would be, um, you know, in the wintertime when you're defrosting the windshield, typically the compressor runs to chill the air and take drop the moisture out before we go, uh, you know, before we blow the hot, before we blow the air through the heater core to rewarm it and blow it up in the windshield. So you can see how a problem in the air conditioning system could certainly affect heater or defrost operation. These systems can be very integrated and interdependent. Problem in one can spill over into the other. So we always got to be aware of that kind of connection between the two systems. So, um, uh, you know, so you're, you know, the cars in your shop, you're investigating a heater performance concern. And, you know, you, know, you might want to be, things you might have to look deeper into uh, would be, um, you know, is the coolant truly hot? Is the coolant hot enough to actually get the job done? Is it actually free flowing? Is it, you, do you have full flow through the heater core itself? Uh, do you have proper airflow across the heater core? Is all the air passing over the heater core? And do you have, you know, the, the, composition of the coolant can actually affect its efficiency. So these are some of the considerations we might have to take into account when in some of the systems and subsystems we might have to look into uh, when investigating a, you know, a heater performance or a heater performance uh, concern from the customer. So um, uh, I just want to make a quick differentiation here because it can affect diagnostics and you know, the way we go about it. You know, looking at some of these uh, systems, if I was to look at an older uh, cooling system here, note that uh, the thing I want you to note from this diagram here really is that the thermostat is right at the, you know, it's right on top, of, usually right on top of the engine at the very front, just before the upper radiator hose. So it's controlling the... Uh, coolant, you know, from the top of the engine uh, right into the upper radiator hose. So that's that's number one. And number two, of course, traditionally, this system is going to have a conventional radiator cap with an external unpressurized coolant reservoir. So just keep those two thermostats in the very top uh, with an unpressurized coolant reservoir that we can draw coolant from or, you know, back and forth to and from as the system uh, warms and cools. Now, if I was to look at a later model system like we're looking at here, um, you can see that uh, the, the thing to note here is this is a closed loop system. We're using a degas bottle that's part of the pressurized system rather than an external reservoir. and um, 
Uh, the other thing of note that can particularly can be affect bleeding and getting circulation started again after we've drained or flushed the cooling system is the fact that the thermostat is located on the low side of the system. If you look at the thermostat, it's typically located with the low, uh, the, where the lower radiator hose comes back to uh, the um, comes back to the engine, and so these systems can actually be quite difficult to. Um, uh, to uh, bleed sometimes and get circulation started. You can have heater core issues. Uh, you've got the car refilled and it can be difficult to get the system completely full again. So uh, let's look at some of the different uh, types of heater cores. Uh, the first one up to, for conversation here is the copper brass uh, V-cell. And I actually have an example of that here. Uh, here is your typical copper brass V-cell. Gets its name from, <coughs> gets its name from the fact this kind of unique v uh, v configuration here. Note that the, the header tank is soldered directly on top of the heater core tubes. Uh, these are notorious for leaking along this seam here. There's a very common area where corrosion or you've got some kind of chemical uh, deterioration going on in the system and you get a leak along this seam. So that's your uh, V-cell uh, type of uh, heater core. Now, another type we have here, uh, this is the, um, what we call the, uh, the um, it's a, oops, I think we might've got a little bit ahead of ourselves. Here is the copper brass um, crimp tank. And here's an example of that here, copper brass crimp tank. And, you know, on, on paper, it might look very similar to the last one we looked at, but what's different here, it's got this, see, it's got this rib going all the way around here. So it's got this kind of a channel uh, all the way around, and we drop the header tank into that, and, you know, we fill it with solder. And so it's much more, much less prone to leaking around the seam on this um, crimp uh, tank uh, uh, design uh, heater core. So that's, uh, you know, bra copper brass uh, crimp tank design. Uh, the next design up here is uh, what we call a mechanical design. Now, they call it mechanical because it's usually a plastic header tank crimped. And uh, there's some foam here, so you can't get a real good look at it. But the copper, the header tank is crimped onto the heater core, you know, the the, the core of the heater core. Um, and it's just, you know, the rubber seal sits in here. The header tank is, sits down, and then we roll the tabs over to seal the header tank onto the heater core. Uh, these can be, as the system ages and the coolant deteriorates, these can be t particularly uh, troublesome uh, from leaks. You know, the chemistry interferes with the seal, and we can have leaks uh, where the plastic meets the, the central heater core. So that's what we call a mechanical design. Uh, some other technology of note here is... Um, oops, we got a little ahead of ourselves here, is this uh, was what we call a turbo, um, did we miss one? No, yes, we did, sorry about that. The other uh, technology, of course, is most modern heater cores are all now some iteration of an all aluminum heater core. So this is a classic, uh, you know, the tubes are fixed. Uh, it's uh, the, the core of the it's a flat tube, almost like a condenser, very similar design to a condenser. The only difference is these tubes typically are open inside. They don't have the little micro tubes like a condenser, but flat tubes, very similar to condenser. This is a typical uh, modern aluminum heater core. And there are different shapes and size and, of them, but for the most part, uh, they look very similar to the, what I'm showing you here. Now, the next piece of technology here is um, what we would call um, uh, a um, what we call a high efficiency turbulator. Now this happens to be it's incorporated in the um, in the mechanical design we looked at earlier, but it doesn't have to be mechanical design. Any tube and fin style evaporator may have this technology. And if you look inside the tubes here, if you look, I've pulled one of them out. It looks almost like a corkscrew here. These fit in the in the tubes. And it acts to disturb or you know create turbulence in the coolant flow, breaks up the coolant flow to provide better surface to you know the provides better contact between the coolant and the surface area of the tubes. It improves the efficiency of the heater core, and this is what we call uh, we call this a turbulator, enhanced efficiency turbulator design. And you can find this typically you will find that on many. Uh, any older tube and fin design uh, evaporator, oh, sorry, condenser, heater cores. 
So uh, the next up here is uh, what we want to talk about, our swivel tube uh, can, uh, heater cores. And I do have an example of that here. Um, here's a, a pretty good example of a swivel tube type heater core. Now, uh, these are significant for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, oftentimes the, the reason for swivel tubes is, you know, sometimes you have to manipulate, you know, if you're trying to shoehorn it into a vehicle where it's a pretty tight space, oftentimes it's necessary to move the tube slightly so it facilitates insulation in a way. And the other big uh, reason for this is um, NVH. I mean, every manufacturer is looking for a smoother running vehicle. Uh, the solid tubes uh, would be connected to the heater codes of the engine. So oftentimes you get a lot of vibration transmitted to the tubes, to the heater core, into the dash, into the cabin of the vehicle. So these swivel tubes, these swivel connections here, there's a rubber seal inside. It provides a kind of a shock absorber. It, it helps to isolate engine vibrations from the cabin, from the heater case. So now these, of course, if there's excessive movement here, the seals can leak and so on. There's a common source of leaking on this style of heater core, but this is what we call a swivel tube, swivel type tube heater core. The other reason that I mention this, I often see um, inexpensive replacement heater cores that look a lot like the original, but the tubes are fixed instead of uh, flexible, instead of swivel. And of course, that can certainly lead to uh, the, the, the the heater core can fail or crack uh, sooner. And you can also have a complaint from your customer. Ever since you replaced my heater core, the engine, the whole vehicle feels rougher. They feel that vibration in the dash because the swivel tubes are missing and using a fixed connection rather than a swivel connection. Okay. So um, that's the swivel tube technology. Um, so in uh, just to emphasize here, I want to emphasize that we are about to... Um, you know, you're about to remove the dash from the vehicle for whatever reason. Uh, maybe the, in the conversation we're having today, the primary reason we're talking about is heater cores. But could you, you could be taking the dash out because you're replacing an air door actuator, because you've got an evaporator leak, maybe an evaporator thermistor has failed. There are many reasons that you may have to take the, that you might be taking a dash out of a vehicle. And what I'm saying to you before you begin, it's always a good idea uh, to take into account um, you know, are there any other issues that it might be reasonable or rational to consider replacing or doing or repairing while you have the dash out? There's nothing worse. Oftentimes, these are five, six, seven, eight hour jobs. And, you know, if I'm going to go to that amount of labor, you're going to disturb everything in the dash. It's worth considering are there other things that you might want to at least discuss with the customer that would be reasonable to consider doing uh, while you have the dash out of the vehicle. So that kind of segues and leads us into discussion, some diagnostic and service tips. Um, and of course, the first uh, conversation here is why do heater cores fail? And heater cores fail uh, typically because of leaks, either chemical type of leak due to corrosion or electrolysis that we we'll discuss in a, little, in a moment. Uh, you can have mechanical leaks because the tubes have cracked, you know, uh, you know, mechanical stress because of the heater core, the, maybe the engine is jumping up and down the, under the hood, and um, uh, uh, erosion uh, that will also, erosion where the heater core leaks from the inside out due to wear, we'll talk about that in a moment. And then clogging because maybe chemical deposits have built up inside the heater core or uh, often external debris like uh, silicone or something of that nature gets uh, clogged, you know, gets pumped up or thrust into the heater core, causing it to be clogged. So either way, uh, the point I want to make here is when a heater core leaks, either from a mechanical stress or from, you know, corrosion uh, issue, uh, there is almost certainly an underlying issue on the vehicle that you will need to correct uh, in order to uh, repair the vehicle, in order to prevent a comeback and prevent the heater core coming back to, you know, coming back to you prematurely. So um, that leads me into a discussion of uh, cooling system chemistry. This is probably the number one cause of initial heater core failure and repeat heater core failures. And I want you to imagine for a moment here, this, these flat, uh, you know, with your brass and your iron and your rubber and steel and so on. I want you to imagine for a moment that you took the whole interior surface of the cooling system, the heater core, the condenser, sorry, the radiator, the engine block and so on, and that you rolled 
the surface out, rolled all those anterior surfaces out onto a flat surface. You'd have so many square inches of brass, maybe so many square inches of iron, so many square inches of steel, rubber, aluminum, plastic, and there's a question mark there, other materials that maybe we're not even aware of. And the point is, if I start, if you were to just flow plain water across these different surfaces, uh, what you can, all kinds of chemical activity is going to start off right off the bat, right? And so you'll have the oxygen in the water, you know, reacting with the steel and the aluminum, and you, you get all kinds of different byproducts from these different chemical reactions. And so um, if we look at another vehicle now, uh, another, so that, let's suppose that last one was a Ford. If we rolled out the interior, if we looked at the square inches of interior cooling surface and all the different components on a different vehicle, we might find a different ratio of metals in the system. And that is really why, uh, that's what dictates, you know, if you walk into the parts store, we we'll look at it in a moment, you find many different types of antifreeze uh, formulations available for Asian, European, conventional, and so on. And the, the reason for all these different formulations of antifreeze is because manufacturers formulate the antifreeze to be very to to be chemically compatible with the types of materials and the amounts of materials used in the cooling system. Remember, um, an antifreeze is a wearing part. Uh, it it literally is consumed. All the additives in an antifreeze are consumed as the vehicle ages. Uh, and the whole idea is to prevent. Um, acid buildup or even alkaline buildup in the cooling system uh, by adding additives in the antifreeze that will neutralize the buildup of acid in the system. So antifreeze, it's a wearing part that's consumed over the life of the vehicle, and that's why it's important to drain it and change it and replace it uh, as the vehicle ages. So, uh, you know, antifreeze, it's application specific for a reason uh, that we've just explained. And there's different chemistries out there. You know, your typical original um, antifreeze was what we call um, an inorganic additive uh, technology. That's what IAT stands for. You've probably heard of oats or, or, you know, organic acid technology and HOTS or hybrid organic acid technology. Hybrid organic acid technology is really a, that type of antifreeze is a kind of a combination of both the old uh, organic um, additive technology and the newer um, um, and the newer organic acid technology. Uh, the point is that these are very carefully formulated to mirror, to match up to the materials and the amount of materials used in the cooling system. Um, and so that's why it's very important. And there are certainly products out there that claim that they're one size fits all, that you can use them in any vehicle. Uh, my concern there is that you could have a longevity problem. They might not last as long as the original uh, over the life of the vehicle. Uh, so choosing the right antifreeze is a pretty pretty important uh, uh, consideration. So as I say, antifreeze is a wearing part and should always be, um, you know, you absolutely need to replace it as part of any kind of service to the cooling system and particularly in the context of replacing the heater core. So um, that brings me to another uh, conversation here. So how do I check? How do I check the condition? You know, I've got a vehicle in my shop, uh, and I do emphasize that you need to check this. You know, you've determined that the heater core has failed and you need to replace it. Uh, before replacing the heater core, you need to evaluate what kind of condition the existing, the old coolant is in. And there are hydrometers and um, there are different ways of doing this. But I find that these um, coolant test strips are the most effective way of evaluating both the freeze protection of an antifreeze and also the chemical condition, the alkalinity or the acidity of the coolant, the overall chemical condition of the um, coolant. And you've probably used these in the past. Typically, you get the vehicle to working temperature. You dip this in, <laughs> in the antifreeze for several seconds. And then depending on the type of antifreeze, whether it's a HOT or an OAT or an IAT, you compare the, you know, the, the colors of the tabs should change. And you match that up to the, um, to the chart on the bottle to determine is the antifreeze, is it acidic? Is it, um, you know, is it alkaline? You know, what, how badly affected or how badly deteriorated is the cooling, uh, the, the actual coolant? 
Now, you're not going to reuse the old coolant, but it's important to understand the condition, the chemical condition of the system before you actually uh, you know, go ahead with your heat of coal repair, for example. Because you may need to take, if the system is very chemically deteriorated, you may need to take uh, corrective action before uh, you replace the heat of coal. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, We seem to have a little freeze up on our slide here. Let's take a look. We got it. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is corrosion. Uh, you know, corrosion is generally due to, remember, heat antifreeze is a wearing part. If you don't if you don't service the cooling system, the all the additives get used up over time. And so you get the buildup of acid in the system. And uh, that can be accelerated even by, you know, bad radio cap or air, if air is getting into the system or the system has a leak or air is getting in there somehow. Uh, the presence of oxygen, of course, accelerates all kinds of chemical mischief in the system, and you end up with getting corrosion. And that, uh, you know, from corrosion, you get solids building up that can clog heater cores, clog cooling passages, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, either way, uh, we'll need to correct that. If we're replacing the heater core, we'll need to correct for the effects of corrosion in the system. We'll get a little bit more into detail on that as we go forward. Now, um, the one of the other, so that's the corrosion type of failure. The other type of failure you've probably heard about is what we call electrolysis. Um, now, electrolysis occurs when you get a, you know, a, a voltage differential developing between the coolant itself and the frame, the chassis, or the, uh, the metal of the vehicle. And I actually have a, a vehicle set up here where we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, um, well, we'll talk a little bit about electrolysis and how you would check for it on a vehicle. So if we can switch to the vehicle, we'll take a look at that. Um, so the way you check for electrolysis, I've got a conventional voltmeter here. Uh, I'm going to set it on volts, as you would expect. I'm going to take the voltmeter, uh, and I'm going to attach the positive probe of the voltmeter to the negative post of the battery. And I will take the negative probe of the meter, and I'm just going to dip it into um, the coolant. Now, typically, the vehicle may to be at working temperature. This vehicle may have been was running recently, but it's not running right now. You need to have the engine running at full work and temperature with the coolant circulating. And then you're going to dip uh, the negative probe of the meter into the coolant. And you can see here, just sitting static, I've got a voltage differential here of 0.14 of a volt. Uh, our rule of thumb is that the, vo the voltage potential in the coolant shouldn't be more than about 0.3. Uh, so, in fact, we had 0 0.23, 0 0.25 on this one earlier. There may actually be a, a little bit of a concern. It may be time to flush the coolant, in fact, on this car. So that's how you would check for electrolysis. Um, you know, very simple check, working temperature, engine running, coolant circulating. That's how you would check uh, for an electrolysis issue in uh, the cooling in the cooling system. I emphasize that because um, uh, the the electrolysis it, it's like a think of electroplating it's going to remove uh, aluminum from the heater core and deposit it on other metal surfaces within the cooling system a bit like a battery the way a battery wears out and so uh, you know if you have a problem with electrolysis uh, if it's chemical then you'll need to flush the system but if it's ele electrical you can you can have electrolysis caused by chemical deterioration of the system you can have electrolysis caused by uh, a voltage grounding. If the chassis is not properly grounded, for a you need to do a voltage drop check between the chassis and battery, between the engine and battery. Of you know, poor ground can also set up electrolysis in the cooling system, causing repeat heater core failure from uh, the chemical reaction that it, that results. So, um, moving along from there, um, uh, in in summary here, what I would say, if you have, if the coolant chemical condition is poor and you've identified an electrolysis issue for for sure you do not want to replace the heater core uh, and just refill the system with with coolant you will need to thoroughly you need to remove the thermostat and thoroughly flush the cooling system before you um you know thoroughly flush the cooling system before you uh re before replacing the heater core. It's not just a question of draining the old coolant and refilling with fresh. You need to drain the old coolant, thoroughly flush the cooling system, use a neutralizing product, a neutralizing chemical. You run the vehicle for about 30 minutes with a neutralizing chemical installed as a whole. You need to be familiar with the instructions there. But in other words, you would need to neutralize the system, drain it, flush it again, and then add the fresh coolant. 
<laughs> to eliminate the underlying uh, chemical imbalance in the system. Very important. Otherwise, you'll have a repeat heat of core failure. So uh, the radiator cap, of course, remember the radiator cap um, uh, causes, you know, the, especially in older conventional systems, you've got two seals. The upper seal is responsible for drawing fresh coolant into the system when the system, as the system cools down. If that's leaking, you end up with air getting into the system. The system doesn't have enough coolant in. Air gets into the system. That accelerates all kinds of chemical mischief in the system. Of course, the spring is out of kilter. Too weak, you don't, the boiling point is too low, and you might not get proper heater core operation there either. So the heater, the radiator cap, simple component, not too expensive, but it's a, a vital component in the um the vital component in servicing the, the the cooling system. So um oops. So the other thing we see a lot of is silicone. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna an easy example for us here. Here I've got the thermostat housing, uh, and here's the thermostat. Now you can see that this thermostat has a rubber O-ring right around it. If I had a dollar for the number of times I open the hood of a vehicle and you look in there and there's a huge you know, bead of silicone sticking out from the thermostat housing or sticking out from under the water pump, uh, for example, um, or the valve cover, the, sorry, the intake manifold. When you're using silicone, the only silicone that makes any difference is the tiny film that's trapped between the clamping surfaces. Any, so a tiny, a very light, thin bead is all you need when you know making a, a silicone gasket seal. And I see people use silicone way too liberally. It breaks off inside, it clogs up cooling passages in the engine, causing hot spots. And of course, <laughs> excuse me, for this conversation, it can easily result in a heater core uh, clogging. And we've have a, I think we've got a picture coming up here. Um, yeah, the one of the, the heater core on the left there has been, you know, we this is a recent cutaway we had here at the training center. Uh, it was from a Dodge truck. The one on the left is all clogged up with silicone. The one on the right is clogged with uh, is clogged with rust. So uh, moving along from that erosion, all those particulates we talked about earlier. Um, you know, the metallic aluminum oxide, for example, as the chemistry goes off in the cooling system, you get tiny metallic particles building up in the cooling system. Uh, the velocity of the coolant increases as it's forced into the heater core. And as it makes a sharp turn inside the heater core, <laughs> excuse me, uh, it, the, the little metallic particles and literally wear a hole in the heater core from the inside out. So you do not want any kind of particulate matter either introduced externally from using dirty coolant, for example, or from generated internally from chemical activity. You do not, sorry, you do not want um, uh, particles in the cooling system. Motor mounts, same thing. Here I've got a, um, I've actually got a failed motor mount. Oh, that's the wrong piece. I got me a failed motor mount here. It's completely separated. Even ones we had one earlier that was just a lot of play in it. You know, if you've got a failed motor mount, every time the motor talks up, that's straining on the heater core, on the tubes of the core, inevitably results in a crack, you know, a, a crack leak either at the servos or at the solder joint going into the heater core. Um, same thing for, um, for um, you know, the, the Heater hoses and the you know the U joints in the heater hose themselves they often deteriorate due to chemical deterioration deterioration in the cooling system. We want to uh, you may want to consider replacing those. I find that doing temperature testing if we switch to the vehicle for just a moment, uh, Corey, we um, I find chemical uh, temperature testing using an infrared camera a very effective way of. Um, A very effective way, and this car was running a short while ago, not some time ago, not, not just two minutes ago. And you see here, I can see the temperature of one hose is about 110 right there. And if I move my thing down here a little bit, the other one's around 95, 88, 89, something like that. You know, if the two hoses are equally hot, you know, 80, 90 degrees equally hot, 
uh, then you probably have circulation through the heater core, but no airflow. It's not removing any heat. Uh, typically, I want to see the inlet hose maybe 175, 180, 190, and the outlet hose should be maybe 30, 40 degrees cooler than that. That tells me I got circulation through the core and I'm extracting heat from the coolant. If both hoses are equally low, maybe 130, 140, then I probably have, you know, I need to look at the thermostat or I've got some kind of a, a engine cooling temperature issue on the vehicle. So um, that's a temperature testing. Um, uh, the other problem we see most uh, fairly recently, let's take a look at this one here, Corey. This is a, a heater core here. Um, on many vehicles today, you'll have a complaint. The customer complains it's very hot on the passenger side, very cold on the driver's side. The heat distribution is not good. And the reason for that, most people think blend door, but the typical reason for that is because the air for the passenger side might go through the might pass through the up those two ducts here. The heater core is divided, if you like. The air for the passenger side may be going to the top of the heater core. The air going to the driver's side is being passed through a duct that's attached to the bottom of the heater core, going to the in the opposite direction. If you have a clog, depending on where the clog is or the, in the heater core, that can cause a, a complaint of excessive. Um, heat on one side and cold on the other. So while, you know, initial suspicion might be blend or uh, clogged heat, of course, a very common cause of that. Uh, Honda has a big, long TSB. It is very common on their CR of 2012, 2014 CRVs. Cadillacs also suffer from this issue. Uh, there's a Honda TSB talks about using the CLV uh, solvent and a sump pump and a three, four hour process of flushing the system. My experience has been it doesn't always work. Often you have a leak at the end of the uh, flush procedure. And honestly, when you do the math for doing the flush process that may or may not work or give you a leak at the end versus just biting the bullet and replacing the heater core from the get-go, often there's very little, you know, the real cost, there's actually very little difference in the cost. So um, I want to wrap it up here with some, um, don't forget, we'll need to, uh, we'll need to flush, bleed and refill the system when we're done. I find the most effective tool for doing that is the airlift tool. This it pulls a vacuum on the system initially, then we open the valve to draw the coolant in. And this way we avoid that issue of a, an air bubble in the top of the heater core that can often, you know, the system cools, okay, the engine keeps is cool, but we can often have trouble getting heat back in the vehicle if we have an air bubble in the heater core, which is often the highest point in the cooling system. So the airlift tool is the perfect tool for that. The other thing I recommend, um, many vehicles today, many vehicles today, whoops, have a, you know, they're going to have a, a water outlet that looks a lot like this may have a bleed screw on the outlet. How many times have you gone to one of these outlets trying to bleed it? And uh, as, as you can see in this one here, this bleed screw breaks off or it breaks the plastic because it's been heat cycled tens of thousands of times. And I'm just mentioning this at the outset. You know, you're discussing the repair with the customer. Just be aware that these are some of the things that you might have to replace as part of that heater core replacement process. So just to keep that in mind. So we're going to wrap this up here with the discussion of uh, dash airflow. And here is the, I have here, this is the dash, the heater case from a 2015 uh, Ford F-150. And here's the heater core. Now, the thing I want you to, to really absolutely emphasize here, note that this core is completely surrounded with foam. The heater core has to be a hand and glove fit in the case. Now, if you look here, we've been pushing, you know, we've been putting in and out a number of times. The foam is busted and broken here. Even if I go like this, and I lay it down. Do you see that there's still a small pathway through here? If the, if you if the air has any opportunity to bleed by the heater core, bleed by the evaporator, bleed by some of the air doors inside the dash, maintaining a sealed pathway for the airflow through the entire HVAC case, case is absolutely critical for successful uh, heater core, or for that matter, evaporator replacement. I've seen many complaints where you the Technicians done a pretty decent job of replacing the heater core, but the customer says it's just not as hot as it used to be. And oftentimes the reason for that, and we're going to look inside here, the reason for that is because the, the heater core is not making a good seal inside the dash. And that's where you may need to take some foam, sealing foam like this here, probably get it at your parts store. And, you know, you, you know, if it's not a custom fit right out of the box, you may have to improvise 
um, to make it seal properly. The other area that we run into issues with on sealing, of course, is the air doors. Some of the older ones are probably, of course, you probably see they use foam. This Ford is using these rubber seals. I've seen these rubber seals, you know, it's rotted. They start falling off. If you put it, you know, an eight, nine, 10 hour labor job back in the dash and you haven't addressed or made sure that the air pathway through the box goes only where it's supposed to be, can't bypass the evaporator, can't bypass the heater core, you're not going to have a success. You're not going to have a happy customer. It's not going to be as hot or as cold as the, as the system could be. And finally, I suppose the other thing on the airflow, this, of course, is the evaporator from, I think it's from an F3, F3, F350. You can see the entire uh, evaporator core is completely clogged. Keep in mind that all air entering the engine, uh, sorry, entering the HVAC case, all air, winter, summer, always comes, all air must come through the evaporator. And so if you have a clogged evaporator and the winter time, it doesn't matter even though if the air conditioning is not working, if it, the airflow is restricted, obviously it's going to affect your heater core performance. So again, you have the case out of the vehicle. It might be worth considering at least replacing both the evaporator and the heater core, especially if this is what you find when you take it out. And uh, that for the same reason, same part of the discussion, of course, um, the, uh, you know, replace the cabin air filter kind of common sense, but, you know, you've just charged the customer a significant amount of money for maybe six, seven hour, hour labor job uh, would be, you know, the, the icing on the cake may be to give that extra bit of airflow, maybe just replacing the cabin air filter. So with that, folks, I'm going to, uh, we, I think we can say goodbye. 2015 uh, Ford F-150s. Or the air door, the air door recirc door, the dog breaks off. Again, if this happens, it usually results in an air conditioning complaint, but often results in a heater com heater quality complaint. Poor uh, duct air temperature in the winter time. So there's something to look out for. The key here is to check for a recirc air door trouble code. And um, again. I'm about to attempt this job. Ask yourself, are there other components or perspectives? What else might I need to consider before replacing the heater core on this vehicle? And so with that, I'm going to turn it back to my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Ryan, and uh, to, to, to talk us out. All right. Thank you very much, Peter. A lot of great tips and information there when it comes to heater cores, uh, what it takes to do the job properly. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for tuning in this month. Uh, hopefully you've, you've taken away a lot from this. We'll be posting the recording to our channel. If you're looking for information on our future sessions in which we're gonna be continuing to feature great topics with our great trainers. Uh, Peter's one example of our entire training staff here. We're gonna to continue to feature different trainers with these. Go to protrainingpowerhour.com and you'll see the schedule. You'll see an opportunity to uh, sign up for future ones. You also see a link there to view some of our past ones in case you missed any of those. In the meantime, if you have additional questions, we're going to encourage you to go to uh, the Four Seasons YouTube channel. You'll see a lot of great information put together by our training staff, including Peter, uh, where there's a lot of more air conditioning, heater core, window lift, lots of great information to be found there as well. So as we uh, close out here, we'll leave you with a slide which has a 1-800 number to our tech line. We've got a bilingual tech line right here across the wall behind us, and they're available Monday through Friday, eight to five, to answer your temp control related questions. That being said, I appreciate y'all coming again and have a prosperous afternoon. Thank you very much. See you all next, next session. Thank you.